In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So seldom do the readings work out so perfectly for a particular occasion than this Sunday. On Father's Day, you have that first lesson of a proud, proud daddy, Jesse, who's standing there as, we'll modernize the parable, there's a story, a major league scout comes and says, one of your boys is going to be big time. We've heard word that you have a prodigious talent in your household. And he says, that's true, that's true. Let me line up my boys and show you what they're all about. So he lines them all up, says, Bobby can hit the ball farther than anybody you've ever seen. You must be talking about him. And they said, no, it's not Bobby. Well, Johnny has wheels like you've never seen. He can run the bases as fast as anyone. Nope, not him. Well, Reed over here, he's a five-tool athlete. He can do it all. There is no weakness in this game. You must be talking about him. No. Well, what about Sam here? Sam here has a fastball that you can't even see when it comes out of his arm. Over 100 miles an hour, they've said. No, not him. Goes to all of them. Says, is that it? Well, yeah, except... My boy is doing chores, but he's barely past puberty, and uh, he may be good for the organ during the seventh inning stretch, but <laughs> besides that, I don't know that he's got a whole lot of talent. And they bring him in, and they says, he's the one. And the dad beams with pride as the son he least expected is the one picked to be that prospect. Perfect. Except one of the things that I told the group that came to our adult formation last week is that the role of the preacher is to look for the rub in the story. Not where it fits seamlessly into what you already want to talk about. In fact, one of the other things I said that I've read and believed to be true is that the role of the preacher is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. So where is the rub? Well, before I get to the rub, one other thing I mentioned last week uh, during the discussion is that during this green season, this green growing season, uh, from the, Pentecost, the Sunday after Pentecost all the way through till we get to Advent, there are two tracks where we have a choice between two Hebrew scripture lessons. The first lesson can either be the continuation of the story that we've been telling, which is what we're doing from Samuel, from, um, uh, from the... The, the, the call of, uh, of Samuel to the desire to have a king, to them choosing Saul because he was big and mighty and strong and him being a failure, uh, and then now the, uh, the call of David. Uh, or we can go with the other track that follows the gospel that's meant to match up week in and week out. Uh, and on that track, the reading is from Ezekiel. And it uses the image of a cedar. Uh, if you're familiar with the use of the cedar. The cedars of Lebanon uh, were used to talk about things that were mighty and powerful. Uh, the lush green cedars of Lebanon were the mightiest, biggest things on the horizon. And he says, God says, referring to the house of David and, and the promise to David and his people uh, that he would pluck uh, a bit from the very top of the cedar tree, just a twig, would plant it at the very top of the tallest mountain, and it would grow into the biggest cedar that people could see forever around, and that would be the kingdom of David. That would be the ancestry of David, that it would, that it would be that big and that powerful and that much of a beacon in the community, uh, and that's the image. And it talks about how the boughs of the tree would be so big that every bird of the sky could, uh, could find home there. Uh, and it would be a respite for all of creation that could gather around it. Um, and that's the image. So now let's go to the gospel. Ask yourself, what's the rub? So Jesus tells the story about, uh, about planting seed, and last week, or uh, I shouldn't say last week because it wasn't last week, but at the beginning of the fourth chapter, he tells that familiar parable of the mad, the mad sower who's casting seeds everywhere, uh, which uh, would shock the reader, the listener, uh, in the first century because seeds were a commodity. They were dependent upon for food. You don't cast seeds everywhere. You don't cast seeds on rock. Uh, you treasure that seed, and you're very careful in your planting. Um, this week... 
he talks about planting the seed and the fact that you really don't know whether it's going to grow or when it's going to grow. Now, I picture, uh, you know that song, inch by inch, row by row, I'm going to let my garden grow? Um, I picture these beautifully tilled uh, 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 gardens uh, with, with little uh, places for each seed. And if you picked up the soil, it was rich and fertile and, and healthy soil that just is inviting a seed to come and grow uh, in its midst. Uh, and then you put the seed in and you, you cover it up a little bit and then you water it and you come back and in a few days you're fulfilled with the promise of, of something growing through, a shoot growing through the ground. It was much different. I realized as I thought back on my time in Jerusalem and what I know about uh, the particular place uh, where they were growing, that's not how it was. There is very little fertile ground there. The topsoil is remarkably thin, it's rocky, it's jagged, it's dry. It is the last thing uh, that you can take for granted uh, that something will grow because you cast a seed. And people would do that. They'd wait on God. And they were dependent on God uh, um, to fill their bellies. They needed it to grow, and they realized uh, that it was, it, it was kind of a crapshoot, whether it would grow or not, that they had to lean heavily on God for it to grow. Uh, and so Jesus uses that as a parable uh, of, of our faith, that we, we don't know when it's going to grow, but God takes care of it. And then he goes on and he tells a different parable, and this is the one that would have made people shake their heads. He said, you know a mustard seed? The tiniest of seeds... He said, they put that into the ground, and it grows into the, uh, the greatest of shrubs. Now, we think of that as just a tiny seed grows into something big. Uh, but what we need to know, the rub, is that the mustard seed, the mustard shrub, was a weed. It was an incredibly prodigious weed. It would grow, and it would take all of the viable soil, that limited topsoil, uh, and it would take over the whole thing so that nothing could grow. It was so pervasive, so intrusive, that it was illegal. It was actually against the law to plant mustard seeds, but Jesus uses that as his image for what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is not like a mighty cedar, not like something that everybody would look upon and say, that is God's greatness and God's glory. The kingdom of God is like an illegal weed. Why was it illegal? Because people felt there was a scarcity of resources. They felt like their land had to be protected from outside forces, that there was only enough for the people that were already there. There was only enough resources to be able to plant what needed to grow, and they had to keep everything else out. So they kept out the weeds. What are the weeds? I think Jesus spent a good bit of time with the weeds of the world. The people he dined with. The people that people said, if you knew any better, you wouldn't be with these weeds. They weren't a drain on resources. They were people made in the image of God. Beloved children of God. So Jesus uses the image of the weed, of a prodigious weed, an expansive weed, to describe the kingdom of God. And when we participate in the kingdom of God, we are participating in the king of kings, in the life of Jesus Christ, who didn't come as a mighty cedar to be served. He came like a shrub, born in a stable, Washing feet, spat upon, beaten, who didn't protect his resources, who didn't say there's only enough for me, who gave everything, everything, even his life, for people who were spitting upon him and beating him. Jesus came to show us that the image of God that the kingdom of God is not like this world, and it doesn't condone the rest of our lives. It's not something we put up against uh, the way that we already were going to live anyway conveniently. It is something countercultural. It is a shrub when we expect a cedar. It is David when we expe expect Saul. It is service when we want to be served. And it's the modeled after the life of Jesus. So why the mustard seed? Because when we fully live into the body of Christ, when we truly follow the King of Kings, 
when we truly put love and service to others ahead of ourselves, it is prodigious and it's inconvenient and it spreads and it can take over the world. Amen.